I'm Ed Hess. I'm professor of business administration at the Darden Business School, the University of Virginia, and co-author of the new book, Humility is the New Smart, Human Excellence in the Smart Machine Age. Today's episode of Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, I'm going to be talking about leadership in the smart machine age and how the industrial revolution model of leadership is obsolete. And we leaders have got to change and become a leader of the future, a leader that's based in humanity not profits. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. But today we're going to be looking at how human beings can excel at the skills that smart machines and smart robots will not be able to do so well at in the coming decades. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go Full Monty. If you're a regular, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And with over 2 million downloads and plays, we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Listen, there are over a million podcasts out there, literally, and thousands of them are focused on business and leadership. But there is only one show that is focused on what is at the heart and the soul of business and leadership. And you're tuned into it right now with me, your host, Dove Barron. Remember, we always need your help in staying relevant, so please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone who's a C-suite leader, a sales leader, an entrepreneur, a leader in any capacity, you know that leadership can be a lonely path. Our show is focused on inspiring those who lead to dive deep, deeply into deeply meaningful, purpose-driven lives that are heart, soul, and mind aligned, so that you can have not only the success, but the fulfillment that allows you to make the massive difference that you came here to make and be an extraordinary leader with a cult-like following. But how are you going to do that if you ignore the facts? And the truth is, you can't. Our guest today says that we are on the leading edge of a societal transformation that will be as challenging and transformative as the Industrial Revolution was to our ancestors. That we as a society may actually not be ready for what's about to hit us. Ed Hess is a professor of business administration at Baton Executive in residence at the Darden Graduate School of Business, University of Virginia. He is a best-selling author, sought-after expert in the areas of high-performance organizations and leadership, learning, adaptation, and innovation. Prior to joining academia, he spent 20 years in the business world as a senior executive. Professor Ed Hess is the author of no less than 12 books, 100 articles, 60 Darden cases, and his work has appeared in over 400 media outlets globally, including... Fortune, Wired, Fast Company, Washington Post, Forbes, uh, HBR, uh, Shrum. I mean, it go, the list goes on and on, including Bloomberg and others. In his 2014 book, Learn or Die, using, the science, using science to build leading-edge learning organizations, was a bestseller. His new book, entitled Humility is the New Smart, Rethinking Human Excellence, in the smart machine age is a timely deep dive into how individuals can excel in the human skills that will complement the smart technology that we're going to be put into in the, with new organizations and a new leadership model that's going to come in the age of smart machines. So please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome Professor Ed Hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to be with you. It's great Wonderful to have you. It's great. So we're talking about a dramatic shift that, you know, I, I've said this for a long time now that things, you know, 
we like to think of things being incremental, and they are, but at the same time, there are things that happen that are major shifts. And I was, I was speaking on a show recently with one of the, uh, a futurist, and one of the things they were talking about was that how in 2007 is this shift point, and it was the birth of the iPhone, and that everything has not gone incrementally since then. It has actually taken these massive jumps. Your background is in, is in leadership, it is in culture, it is in all those kinds of things. Tell us how, how you're able to see this age of smart machines impacting leadership as we know it. Because leadership for many people seems to be one of those things, yeah, but they can't replace me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I think that if we start with the industrial revolution model of how we organize, manage, and lead businesses has driven us for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that model is going to be obsolete, if you will, in the digital reg revolution or the smart machine age. Yeah. Organizations are going to basically downsize dramatically. Yes. Technology is going to dehumanize business while at the same time humanize it. And that <laughs> is where leadership comes in. And I believe that basically you can't command and control or direct people to do the skills that technology can't do. You can enable them. Leaders are going to become enablers. Leadership is going to become enable ship, if enable you will. Ship. And and this enabling enabling and creating the right environment where people can excel in the right environment where they can basically deal with their ego and their fears that is the leaders will own that environment they got to role model the right behaviors and they've got to work with individuals and help them be all they can be and that's when you're going to get excellent human performance united with technology and that's going to be the differentiator. And it's, so it's, it's leader, leadership is leadership will saying, be very people. It's interesting what you're saying because, um, you know, as you know, you, you had this background too, but I'm a consultant. I work with companies and organizations and I do, you know, work with them in their leadership and building their culture. And, you know, I have many friends in the industry. And there are friends in the industry I know who do way better than I do. And the reason they do way better than I do is because they sell strategy. They sell, you know, technique and strategy. And, and I said, you know, it's a very interesting thing because maybe I'm a little old now, but 10 years from now, that world is going to be gone because all the technique and strategy will be smart machine. And it is the humanity side, yes. the quote soft skills that, yes. that they're going to be so desperate for. And that's exactly what you're talking about, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I can't say it enough. <laughs> if it's it's the and the leadership aspect is is if if you will, is that human component as to how I connect and relate and build a relationship with you where you feel like like this, you're in good hands because you trust me. Then we can do the heavy lifting, thinking wise and collaborating wise. The soft skills are going to be so critical, and we have not emphasized them in the business world because you didn't need it when the goal was efficiency and yeah. scale. Yeah. Now the goal is highest order thinking and emotional engagement. It's fascinating to me, um, this this whole thing, because again, like I said, everybody's been fast, fixated on these these strategies that are very technical and getting to that bottom line through, as you said, through efficiency. Um, and long before Daniel Goldman started, gave it the, the, the brand name of emotional intelligence. You know, we were talking about you and I, you know, because we're not kids, we're talking about these soft skills and the need for the humanity and why that is important. But, you know, I always felt, I certainly, I mean, I've been doing this 30 plus years and you've been doing it a long time. For a lot of the years, I felt like I was pushing a boulder uphill because yeah. the argument was always, listen, yeah. what matters is the bottom line. What matters is the profitability. What matters is to get the most out of my people in the hour that they're there. Well, now we've got disengagement at over 70%. Yes. We can't keep millennials in a job more than two years. Yes. So what's the missing strategy? Well, the missing strategy is humanity, and that depends on the development of the individual. However, you, one of the things you said uh, in your book is you talked about um, higher order critical thinking. And I would put it to you that the argument on the other side is 
uh, in fact, I read just very recently that we are two years away from a laptop computer, uh, a computer the size of a laptop, being able to think faster and more critically than a human being. Well, the laptop, two years from now, the laptop will be able to do certain types of thinking faster and better than us. Absolutely. The thinking, the innovative thinking, the creative thinking, and when I say the higher order critical thinking, it's the very complex thinking that's involved with uncertainty and unknowns. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have data, all right? You're not going to have data, so it's going to be inferential. It's going to be sensing and intuitive. And that the computer and the laptop is, I don't believe, is going to be there in two years. But it's that innovative thinking and it's that creative thinking. And if you, if you think about it, let's go back to the humanity part. Yeah. The science is clear. We can't think at the highest levels by ourselves. We only can, basically, we need others. Right. Teams. It's going to move from individuals. It's going to move from the big me to the big we. So think about how individuals... You and I are on the same team and you make a you want to you know, I want you to help me think, but I'm not going to ask you to critic to find wh what am I missing? Critique me if I don't trust you. Right. We've got to be all in the same game and trust is emotional. Trust is all around. OK, am I fearful? And then it's also tamping down our egos, where we're not so defensive, where we're open-minded, where we redefine ourselves, not by what we know or how much we know, but by the quality of how we think, listen, and engage with each other. And so it's this, it's this me and you eyeball to eyeball, so to speak. Is, is there the trust? Is there the caring? Are, you, are we out for the same thing, the best result in helping each other? Are we helping each other look good? Or is it the survival of the fittest type of mentality that you are my competition? Mm -hmm. All of that type of stuff will basically get in the way of organizational success. And the leader's job is, is to basically get rid of, mitigate ego, mitigate fear, and enable psychological safety. Right. And all human beings trying to have their self-determination needs met. In other words, you feel a sense of autonomy. You feel a sense that you've got min meaningful relationships at work. And the people you work for care for you. C-A-R-E, care for you as a human being. Yeah, I, I, I wrote all about the very things you're talking about in my last book called Fiercely Loyal. And yes. this whole thing around collaboration as opposed to competition. Yes. The community and, yes. and all, you know, it, it's, I mean, we are singing to the choir here, right? Each of us yes. very much. However, I want to address the other side of that, and that is that I, one of the things I notice uh, more and more, uh, when I started in the workforce, which is a long, long time ago, uh, people retired at 60, maybe 65. If they had their own business, probably 60. But, you know, if they were waiting for the shake, then, you know, it was 65. <clears throat> one of the things I'm noticing more and more, it, particularly in family-driven uh, family businesses, is that the president, the founder of the company is sticking around to 70 and 75. Yeah. And the problem with that is he's taking the command and control mentality with him into for the next 15, 20 years when his son or daughter, who is now in their 50s, is yeah. already innovatively thinking. He's already thinking collaboratively, but is the old guy has got a stranglehold on. I want to know from you, what's that? How do you deal with that, particularly because we're not kids, you and I, yeah. and, and, you know, and it's, it's easy for them to think we're on that team, you know, the command and control team. Yes. How do you address that with them? Because it's easy for me. I just look at them and say, listen, you're a dinosaur and you're going to die. Yeah. But th that, doesn't, that doesn't loosen that, that death grip yeah. that they have on a company. Yeah, I, I've seen that movie, too. And, um, <laughs> and, and over, over the years, the movie has frustrated me and. I've only been able to deal with that movie if I've spent a lot of time, and I'm sure you have to, with each family member and then with, let's say, the patriarch and the matriarch. Mm -hmm. And the matriarch gets it usually. Yeah. All right. And the matriarch, we start talking about, look, the reason your husband wants to keep the control is this is his life. Yep. But think of all he could do in society, in charity in your church work, 
We need to find something for him to move on to that is meaningful. People can't let go unless they have something meaningful to move on to. And in the situations where it's been successful, people have basically moved on to, whether it's in government service or it's in religious service or it's public service, but they have something that their ego strokes are met, but they 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 can contribute and then they can free up. I've, I've never been able to have the patriarch stay in and the 50 year old take over and change the culture. You, you have to, they have to move out into something meaningful, not going home, not retiring. No, uh, that's never worked. And, and so it takes some time because it takes about a year to set up what the patriarch is going to move into. And then you have to, and but part but of it, the challenge that is, is the, I mean, I've, I've dealt with this myself. I'm, I'm actually dealing with it right now with a president of a company. Um, and, and, you know, we we're talking about ego earlier and the psychology of the individual, yeah. but the, at an ego level, the identity of that yes. person is, I am the founder of this organization, uh, you know, yes. and, and one of the things I, I've said is I used to think of those people as their company being their baby. I don't think of it that way anymore. I think of it as a conjoined twin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's mm -hmm. tighter than a baby yeah. And, yeah. and there's a real feeling of death of separation of that identity and so you know we've had the, particularly one we had one of those meaningful conversations like what else can you do and this person's very mm -hmm. politically minded you know you could get out there you can you know if you don't want to run yourself you can support but that that death grip is not letting go and you know and it's interesting because the next in line is very much smart machine oriented, yeah. very much yeah. social oriented, very much relationship yeah. community. So it's a fascinating dilemma. And I think that you and I right now are standing on the edge of that bridge where the command and control are not over it yet. They're not onto the other side. And the new leaders are on the bridge, but they're not, they've not taken over the bridge yet. And it is, it is a battle of ego. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it is a battle of ego and it's, it's, if you, another way of, of phrasing it, it is, it's a fear. It's a fear Absolutely. of fear of letting go, fear of not being needed, wanted fear of really of mortality ultimately. And, uh, the only, the only way I've been able to deal with it is, is, is the matriarch. The matriarch is, uh, the power of pillow talk in family businesses <laughs> yes. is 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 so powerful and yeah. doing it for the you know the the children and you owe it to the children and you need to give her or him uh, the 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 chance and and I would have been wanting to do these things in my life and you've asked me to put them off for the business and now you've got the business where you can do this and let's us do things and uh, there's no magic to this. It's all human dynamics. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. All right. Sometimes and, uh, that ego is just so, so fierce. Big. There's nothing you yes. can do. And, so, and for me, so because big. of my background in psychology, one of the things is, you know, for me, I, I immediately can see how old that person is. I yeah. can see where they're, in, where they're emotionally stuck. Yes. That this person is so, 13 years old emotionally and you know and enormously successful hundreds of millions of dollars of business yes. phenomenal business acumen but when it comes to that emotional identity piece this person is 13 years old and it's so sad because you, know, you and I both know that the upper level of any business is very often the founder yes. that the business will not excel past the ego of the founder because it's going to be about this it's about holding on and that the next generation will let it go a little more, move forward a little more. It's, it's a fascinating piece. So, so walk us through because you've got you got four pieces that you've got in here that you talk about that we've got to focus on. Walk us through some of the some of that pieces, and, and then we can do an overview, and then we can dive a bit deeper. Sure. the o The overview is is that in order to think at your highest level, you've got to be able to listen, relate to other human beings, and collaborate at the highest level. Those are the critical behaviors. In order to do that, you've got to basically manage yourself and you've got to overcome your humanness, your natural reflexive cognitive ways of a processing information that confirms what you believe. We're, we are very, 
we we process what confirms what we believe and we're also cognitively blind mm -hmm. and we're emotionally defensive because we identify with what we believe and what we know and and i tried for years, really, two years with the executives, convinced, trying to convince them that, gee, you need to basically adopt some humility. And I found that humility just didn't sell to executives. So I had to come up with a different way of saying, you can't identify with what you know or how much you know, because the machines are gonna know much more than you will ever know, remember it perfectly, faster, etc. Why don't you identify with being an excellent thinker, listener, relator, and collaborator. And, and the drive for excellence, to be able to think excellently and listen excellently and collaborate excellently. And that became the concept of New Smart, which I introduced into the book. And the principle of New Smart says, my ego's not invested in what or how I know. It's invested in the quality of my thinking, which allows me to be more open-minded which allows me to go seek and find disconfirming information, which allows me to ask you, Dove, what do you think? Where, what am I missing? And to be open-minded and thankful that you're helping me see that what I'm missing. It also allows me to tamp down the me part and to truly listen and not be making up the answer in my mind when you're talking, mm -hmm. not to be thinking about something else, not as soon as you quit talking you know, we start talking instead of asking questions. All of this tamps down the ego and the humility and makes us more humble, but it's because we want to be new smart. And so new smart's the first concept. Humility is the psychological construct of humility, not submissiveness, not thinking lowly of myself, not being meek. No. It's, being, it's being realistic. What do I know and what do I not know? Being realistic, the fact that I didn't get to where I am and I'm sure you didn't get to where you are by ourselves. We had loved ones, we had teachers, we had people that helped us, whether it was in our business or clients. I mean, we are, nobody climbs the mountain by themselves. Nope. And, and being, you know, and then realizing that in science, it's called the mediocrity principle. I'm not the center of the universe, all right? And, and. I don't know, hey, some of the founders might struggle with that one. <laughs> they, 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 they will struggle, but, but it's that because in order to engage with people and engage with people, it can't be all about you or me. The difficulty is culturally, at least in the United States, culturally, we're the most individualistic, mm -hmm. extreme individualistic culture of any, if you will, democratic or, you know, economy in the world. Yeah. All right. We also are the most survival of the fittest. We're social yeah. Darwinism here, yeah, all right? Absolutely. And that doesn't work in the, in the smart machine age or the digital revolution because I can't win by myself. You and I and four or five other people as a team, we can take the world if we trust each other and believe in each other, if we're transparent, if we're authentic, if we're candor, if we're candid with each other, and if we care for each other. If we care for each other and there's that positive regard and that warmth, all of the stuff that you write about, all right? But it's that interesting because because it's a complete, I mean, this is what, what's so silly about it for us. I mean, so there's two levels here. First of all, I hear those older leaders saying, listen, I get it, the smart machines, all that's coming. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to be gone in 10 years. So I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to keep running the command and control. Yeah. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is, you know, aside from not what, you know, it doesn't really impact me, is that it's basic. I and mean, what I mean by that is, we're talking, you and I are talking about understanding tribal thinking. This is not, this is not because of smart machines. This is what people had to do when they were in the freaking caves. If they wanted to survive, they had to collaborate and work yes. as a team and think yes. creatively about how do we make, how do we get lunch? <laughs> yes. Yes. No, no. It's so beautiful. We're actually going back to the hunter gatherer days. Exactly. All right. We're going back because people had to be this way in, and in, you know, and still in different parts of the world, it's much more this way than it is in the United States. And, it was so ironic is, is, as I said, businesses are going to, technology is going to dehumanize business because it's going to reduce the headcount. There's going to be massive, basically, uh, 
uh, automation of jobs mm -hmm. in the service industry and professionals. But the organizations that's left is going to have to be much more people centric and humanistic for all the reasons we're saying. The people that are not working are going to have to work with each other in communities. I may raise chickens, you may raise vegetables, and we're going to help each other. When you have a problem, you know, doing your thing, I'm going to help you out. You're going to help me out. Guess what that is? That's the old days. Exactly. The ironic thing is we've got to go back, as you say, to the tribal era and reconnect with our humanity. We have gotten, at least in the United States, so competitive over mm -hmm. the last 30, 40 years. Absolutely. And, and we have lost sight of humanity. We have lost sight as to what's the purpose of society. What's the purpose of business? The purpose of business generally, that's the way a lot of people find their meaning in life and make for a better life for themselves and their family, yeah. where their kids have better opportunity than they do. How do you do that? By commercializing something that you can get money for or swapping things that you can money for. Right. And we're going to basically have to go back to the fundamentals, the common good, instead of, and what I say, instead of the big me, it's got to be the big, big we. Yeah. yeah and, it's, uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, we're, we're moving forward at such hyper speed. Yeah. And, that, and, you know, I spoke about this very recently. We're moving forward at hyper speed in order to find ourselves where we started. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The technology that, that's the ironic. Gone. That's the ironic thing in it. Yeah. So the <laughs> yeah. technology is 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 incredibly fast. I mean, you know, like I said, you know, it's only it's only ten years ago that uh, we're in twenty seventeen. It's only ten years ago that the iPhone came out, and really, the iPhone. I mean, my iPhone right here has a better technology. You probably, I know I remember a show called The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Do you remember that show? Yes, yes, I, yes, I remember yes. that was a kid. I yep. loved that show, The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Yep. They made a movie about it uh, very recently uh, that I really loved too. But in The Man From U.N.C.L.E., the, the two lead guys, um, Ilya Kuryakin and what, I can't remember the other guy's name, but it was a great show. Uh, but they were a part of the CIA and they would go into this room and behind them was these big wheel tape computers. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was reading about this recently, that that computer had one-fifth, one-fifth of the computing power of this thing in my hand, which I happen to call a phone, and it's the last thing it does is use it as a phone. Like, so the technology is taking off like a rocket, but the problem is I think that we have tried to keep up with the technology at a humanity level. And in fact, we actually have to go the other way at a humanity level. We have to come back to this. So it's that come back to the basics because you're never going to be able to be as fast as the technology. So you're either the technology guy who builds the technology, and that's, that's great. Stay on top of that. But if you have to work with people, and I don't know anybody who doesn't, you better learn humanity. And as I said in my last book, it, I don't care if you're the CFO, the CIO, the CTO, whatever it is, the CFO, your new title has to be CRO, Chief Relationship Officer, and it might be Chief Human o Chief, Chief Human Officer. Like we got to get back to that. What are the warning signs that you're seeing that that people are not on this, and how do we get them to to shift? Well, there are a few companies that are onto it, and they're the exemplar companies happen to be pretty powerful companies because they excel so well. Mm -hmm. um, and in my last two books, I focused on Google, which is a great innovation company, Pixar Animated Studios, which is a great creative company, Bridgewater Associates Limited, the biggest hedge fund in the world, which is a great critical thinking organization, um, the United States Navy SEALs, which is a great operational excellence organization. Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing when you, and there's some others, when you mm -hmm. study those organizations, what you find is they have very similar cultures and very similar processes to get to the point of becoming people centric and humanistic. Mm -hmm. And they have designed, they've gone through the transformation. I, I have a story in the, the, the Learn or Die book on Intuit. Intuit went to the transformation. And of the amazing thing, what did they do the first two years? They transformed the senior leadership team. Right. They didn't do anything but have the senior leadership team 
work on themselves. They each had a personal coach and worked on empathy and humility because the leaders have to role model. Every organization is going to go through four transformations, I believe. A technology transformation, a cultural transformation, a leadership behavior and mindset transformation, and HR is going to become human development. Yes. The, or the business is going to be in the business of developing humans because the education system doesn't produce. We don't educate people to be human, great collaborators, emotional intelligence, great thinkers, creators, innovators. The business is going to have to retrain people. And, and people, when they see those companies and they study those companies, they're willing to make a movement and they generally make small movements and try things out. And I found that they, they're, they're, they'll go at the personal stuff indirectly. What do I have to do to be a great innovator instead of how do I become a better person or a mm -hmm. better leader? How do we be a big, okay, well, to be a great learner, a great innovator, or a great person in the way we're talking about it, it's all the same stuff. So whatever sure. labels, whatever labels that, that, that somebody can buy into that with where their psyche and their ego, but it's hard work and, and they'll be like anything in life. I've got in chapter eight in the book, a book on that's a, a diagnostic for individuals train like a champion. It's like anything in life. Those people that put in the hard personal work and transform themselves, the books that do your work, your last book, it's a great book. Okay. And yes, I did read it when you sent it to me. It's a great book. Thank you, you, are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are on the, you are on the pathway, man. And if, but as you know, that's hard work. People have got to be committed. They've got to basically focus on behaviors. Good intent's not enough. They got to measure themselves. They got to have an accountability partner. They got to have people helping them. They got to have high standards. They got to be resilient because they're going to mess up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got my list of things that I look at every day that, and it changes yes. as I improve and I, that I work on and I grade myself and I'll, I'll, when I leave this, I'll go do an after action review and I'll just roll the tape and say, gosh, not, did I look bad or stupid? Where did I not connect? Where was I not responsive? Where did I not really hone in on what Dove was saying? Where, where did we, where did, where did we not get the, the chemistry? Was it me? Was I too full of myself? Was I not listening? What's going on? It's hard work. And, but the people that put the work in, it's like you, you cannot underestimate the human benefit and the benefit to other people and what it does. It's exponential results in an organization. And I couldn't and some, agree more, but at the same time, the argument, as you know, is yeah. Listen, buddy, I've been doing it this way for 20 years. Yeah. It works. Yeah. We are 100 million, 500 million. We're a billion dollar company. I've been running the show this way. Clearly, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. Why do I need to work on myself? And even if I did, so what? I'm gone in 10 years. I'm gone in 15 years. So this is, this is for me, it's always the, the sticking point yeah. because the next gen, they get it. But the, but the present gen founder leaders who are in their late 50s, 60s, even 70s, man, that, that is like yeah. prying, prying stuff off the rock. It, it, it is. And, and, and there's no, there's no magic. No. And there's no magic. I can, I can share out of friendship, you know, something I've tried and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Right. Fear. Fear sometimes works. Fear yeah. of. What, why did you build this? What, what, what did you, what, what do you want your legacy to be? And then do you understand that within five years, your business technology and competition basically can destroy it mm -hmm. and explain, try to go through why, what's going to happen depending on what the business I says, do you want a legacy? Do you want the family name to stand for something? Well, I think you've got to basically get on the offensive because this will hit you before you see it, if you don't take action. Yeah. And once you see it, it's too late. Okay. That's true. It, yep. It's too late. It's a little bit like you didn't do your cardi your cardiac work and then you're going to have a heart attack and you're going to have a massive heart attack because the technology is going to be overwhelming and you're not going to recover from, you may not die, but you're going to be 
put out a commission. Yeah. And sometimes if, if positive inspiration, family aspiration, the betterment, my experience is if that doesn't work, the only other thing that can work is fear. And then if they're just, you got in, you know, you got somebody that's just so thick headed, um, and everything, you know, it's sort of sad, you know, you just move on to somebody that wants that, that, that needs your help. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating for me that, I mean, like I said, at the psychological level, how and we all go through it and me, you, all of us, we, we'll go through it, but that how much the ego clings Yes. And, and as you were saying earlier, you know, the mind is looking for evidence of that which it believes to be true. Even if that, would, yes. even if that which it believes is false, it will That's only right. be looking for the evidence of which right. it believes. And right. so, you know, it, it becomes a mute argument where we as consultants have to actually go, you know what? I, I respect what you've done, but you are clearly not ready for this. And you might not ever be ready and, and until they put you in the ground. But it's fascinating for me that 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 death grip is so strong, um, and yet, as you said, you know, it's on the horizon, and you and if you if you wait till you can see it, it's too late. Too late. Yeah. My work, as you know, is about finding and operating from a place of what I call soul purpose. For me, the soul of leadership is the people. It, it's the commitment to self discovery that drives the individual from a deep level uh, consciously and unconsciously to what I would say, what I call reconciling and def, uh, the, uh, the uh, disenfranchised and compartmentalized parts of ourselves. Some of the leaders that I work with, that I coach, that I mentor, um, that I have a ton of respect for, they think that the, the soul of leadership is influence. Uh, and others have other opinions. From your point of view, what is, would you say is the very soul of leadership, and, and for that matter, even business? The soul of leadership, I would say, is enabling others mm -hmm. to be all they can be. Yeah. And so the soul of leadership is developing, helping, caring. Um, and for that to happen, there has to be trust, true trust. Um, and so it's that is that, you know, did did are you in a better place? because I was part of your life and it, working in my business, did my business contribute to you and your family mm -hmm. in meaningful, purposeful ways, not just money, right. not just money. Business is money is not enough. You know, too, too many people want to become a leader because of the four P's more pay, more perks, more power, more prestige. All right. That is not, you, you know, you may get there because that's your drive. But once you get there, you you'll find out it's that empty. all of that is is really meaningless and will evaporate if the hum, human part, if the people, if the people are not part of something bigger than themselves, which they can feel proud of being part of. If you don't know people and spend time and and the, spend the personal time and ask them the questions, you know, how can I help you grow? What am I doing that's getting in your way? What am I doing that you want me to do more of? Right. You know, and have those conversations, those honest conversations of candor that, you know, and, you know, and, and so what's the soul? The soul is heart to heart. Yeah, I agree with you. In order, I mean, you know, obviously, and I'm going to state the obvious. You're not 20 years old. You're not even 40 years old, but you're not thinking like somebody of your own age. You and I just talked about, you know, that there, there are a younger generation that are the, uh, the often young Gen Xers uh, and even millennials who are certainly thinking this way. And our generation of baby boomers, you know, they're, they're the ones with the death grip. What was the belief that was the most difficult for you to give up in order to move to this mindset? Or do you think that, that was always there for you? No, it wasn't always there for me. Not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I, I hit the wall. I hit the wall at age 43. Um, I grew up, uh, um, I'll try to make it short. I grew up uh, a very humble background, uh, was very 
uh, driven, and I was very fortunate. Good teachers, good mentors, and uh, I became a senior partner in a Wall Street firm at age 33. I was what they called a gunner, all right? I worked hard. Uh, I was driven. I told my people, look, I'll take care of you. I'll be honest with you. Integrity above all else. You do your job and I'll get you promoted. I'll send you to school. I'll do whatever. But I don't care about your personal life. Don't bring your personal life to work. And I don't have time with chit chat with you. I was a machine. Right. I was a machine and I produced results. I produced good results. Unfortunately, I was a machine at home. Mm. And so... I, I hit the wall when I came down uh, for breakfast one morning in, in uh, 1987, and my wife sat, and this is a true story, and I'm embarrassed to tell it. It's so bad, but I'm telling it. Uh, it's a true story. I came down, and she says, we need to talk. I says, oh, okay. Uh, what about? And, uh, you know, I'm going about getting my breakfast, and she says, you've changed. You're not the man I married. You're not here even when you're here, mm. okay? Emotionally, okay, you're vacuous. Well, I didn't even know what that word meant, but I knew it wasn't a positive thing. <laughs> it so wasn't a round kept, of applause. It was not a round of applause. Now, this is, in, this, this is the part that's terribly embarrassing. This tells you how bad I was gone. Right. She said, I want to talk about this. And I said, hon, I've got a very important meeting. Can we talk about this tonight? I need to leave. And I left. I came home and there was a note on the table saying, I need some time. You need some time. You need to do some work. And, and so we separated and, uh, and, uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I've been blessed in my life and lucky in my life. I found a coach, um, a woman coach who was the uh, first person to graduate from first woman to graduate Columbia medical school as a psychiatrist. And she sat, and she was a she uh, was a small lady, and she sat in a little big chair with her feet off the ground, and she looked at me, and she said, "Ed, you have a lot of work to do. Do you have the courage to do it?" I said, "I do." She says, "You can't even answer that question because you don't even know what I'm talking about." And so then, from there on, we were off, mm -hmm. and I went through, um, you know, a lot of hard work and a major transformation to become a human being again, to become a caring human being to be there when I was home for my wife and my daughter. That was uh, because I didn't want to lose her. And, and then when I went back to work, what I found out was amazing. I kept my rules, work hard, I'll take care of you. But I started caring about my people as people. We'd go to lunch and talk person to person. How can I help you? What's going on in your family life? And they'd and the say, amazing, what the hell happened to Ed? And is there a pot in your basement that took over? That, that is <laughs> exactly right. But the amazing thing, the amazing thing is the performance went off the of charts. Yeah. And why did it go off the charts? You can give, you can give our friends listening the answer because you know why it went off the charts. Because... People perform for people they love and care about. And we forget Bingo. this. We forget Bingo. this all the time. Like, this is my argument from the stage with working one-on-one -on -one with leaders is you think another strategy is going to make it better and you are smoking a fat one. That is not what works. What makes people perform better is that you love and care about them. And, I, and the example I give all the time is, is very simply. You work for a boss who asks you to do something and to, you know, to get to that uh, outcome that needs to be gotten to. And your boss is pretty good to you. It takes care of your wages and et cetera. And make sure you get your, your promotions, much like you were talking about. But then on the same day, your best friend asked you to do something that would actually take you away from work and you'll lose money. But you deeply love and care about this person who's been there for you. Which choice will you make? And the answer is every freaking time you're going to do a thing for the person you love and care about. Yes, yes. yes. And it's like, hold on. Well, what if you combine the two? And yeah. I know I grew up in that world too, where you know these are my employees. I'm the boss. I don't have time to be friends with them. I'm not their friend. Well, you better start becoming their friend. You better start letting them into your life and you into their life because those lines that we used to say are very separate are now very blurred. And if I don't feel like you care about me and I work for you, I will find somebody else. My line is this. If you don't fall in love with your people, someone else will. And when people fall in love with somebody else that they're not with, 
they go off and have an affair. That's true in marriage, and it's damn true in leadership and business. Yes, and and you know the 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 yes, yes, yes. We're in complete agreement. And but may I may I share something which is uh, which gives me hope, and maybe it will give you hope. I facilitated a a day in Washington D.C. in in April with the senior, the most senior innovation and R and D people at some major companies, a major pharmaceutical, a major hotel company, a major big global manufacturing company, major companies. And we were having these types of conversations. And so about 1.30, I says, okay, what do y'all want to talk about? One person raised his hand. He says, I want to talk about the role of love, capital L, in a business. And I said, that's interesting. And I thought that the rest of the the, a lot of engineers, I thought the rest of these guys are going to blow this guy away. I says, what do you guys think? They all said, absolutely. That's our biggest challenge. And so we had a two and a half hour conversation about the role of capital L love in a business with these senior people from household name companies, because something was going on inside of them that they felt like with their people. That gives me some hope that we are on the edge. It's not... This is not the majority of companies or majority of people by any means, but we are on the edge yeah. of something that's big. And you have been on the leading edge for it for years. And and, and out of that, what's fascinating is, is uh, uh, one of them invited me. I'm going to Europe in uh, October with 25 other people, and we're going to have a session on love. And that gets my juices going, man. Oh, yeah. I am so, it, I'm so with you. I'm, I'm, I'm on that plane. I agree yeah. with you fully. Yeah. So t tell us, what do you think is the most practical thing a C-suite leader, or for that matter, even a high-level uh, entrepreneur, what is the most practical thing they can get from what it is you've been sharing with us? I think the most practical thing is to focus on transforming yourself immediately. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to sell the book, but that's the purpose of the book, yeah. how you can basically take a diagnostic, figure out what you're going to work on, how, managing your thinking, managing your emotions, improving your listening and learning, collaborating or becoming, if you will, controlling your, your ego. Start working on yourself. Read your book. Buy Dove's book. Read it. Because our books are different, but they overlap. They complement sure. each other. Absolutely. They send the same message. Yeah. They, they go about it in different ways. And and. Not that my way is better or your way is better. People no, will relate. It's exactly what we're talking about. They collaborate. They're, they're collaborative. And work on yourself. And, and then once you're working on yourself, then start working on your culture. Because you can't put in the culture behaviors, if you will, uh, and become, um, you know, candid, data-driven, de uh, devalue elitism, okay? Permission to speak freely. Self-determination. You can't do that unless you're ready to behave a certain way. So do it. Get get some help. Call Dove. That's what I'd tell them. Call Dove and do a diagnostic and start working on yourself. Because until you do the work on yourself, you can't transform your business. Yeah. You can work. You can do them. You don't have to get yourself completely there. Because guess what? You're not going to get completely there. there you're going to no be a that. work in process. I'm a work in process, I hope, to the day I die. If I stop working, then I'm dying faster. That's I may it. be alive, but I'm dying faster. <laughs> a round of applause. Fully agree. So I'm going to ask you, uh, what is, uh, if you get to put one thing on your gravestone, only one short statement about how you lived, what do you want it to say? I cared about others. Hmm. It's simple, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we, we have yeah. these grandiose ideas, but when it yeah. all comes What would down you put? To, what would you put? That I lived with sole purpose and helped others to do the same. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's that same thing. It's like my language, not yours. I yeah. gave a shit and helped yeah. people to give a shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You yeah. can make money out of the process and, and do well, fabulous, because that assists you to make a bigger difference. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. But you've got to be, you know, it's like. But money's it's not the purpose. 
Money's not the purpose. No, and, and this is, you know, one of the things, I, you know, we do purpose work with companies, with leaders, and we say, you know, we, we help you have a purpose-driven organization, but that starts with a purpose-driven leader. And you think, and we all go into it for the same reason. If you started a business, you started a business for, for one reason. You wanted to make your life and the lives of the people you love better. That's fine. That's the given. That's the, the bottom of the hierarchy of needs. Okay, you did that. Now you've done that, what is the purpose of the business? It's sure as hell not a bigger house or a, a, a new Mercedes. What's the actual purpose? And so few leaders can answer that question. That's what we do is like, let's find that, that core soul purpose in you. Let's find that in your executive team. Let's find that in the organization. And then as you just said, Ed, then everybody performs at a level you've never even imagined because there's emotional safety. And I love that you said that because I think this is what so few leaders get. I'm talking to a president recently who believes his people are safe. And I had to, I'm like, I got to tell you the bad news. He goes, what? I said, your people are living on the edge. He goes, no, they're not. I go, okay, I can't argue with you. I'm just telling you because I know I've, in, I've interviewed them. Your top guy in this area, he thinks uh, when, the, when the leadership changes over, he's gone. This guy who is under the second in command, he thinks that you, the founder, hate his guts and would love to get rid of him, which is true. Uh, and all these people are unstable. Are they high-performing people? They are, but they're not emotionally safe. So they're never going to go to the level they can. Even though they're performing at a level that is outstanding, where they could perform is yes. way beyond that if they had emotional safety. Yes. And, and, and what's, what's interesting, or at least what I believe is, the smart machine age will either destroy companies like that or it will force them to move. It yeah. will, the technology is going to force human change in order to stay in existence. Yes. That's what I believe. And so to some, yes, the technology is going to dehumanize business because it's going to reduce headcount, but it's going to make those businesses that succeed and flourish are going to become more humanistic, more caring, more loving, more people, because uh, that's the environment in which people will be able to do the work that people are going to be doing excellently. Absolutely. That's that's the uh, the irony. So, as you know, I've I've said to many times to to uh, women executives, don't lean in too far and lose all your emotional strengths and your ways of collaborating in your in your humanity, because that's going to be more valuable in the smart machine age than it was in the industrial revolution age. Technology is going to propel more women into the C-suites when, you know, equity didn't do it and legal didn't do it, but technology is, can, is going to do it. Yeah. Men will also have to take their collaboration and their emotional skills to a higher level, and they can do it. Those who don't do it are going to basically fall by the wayside. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the technology is actually going to have us embrace the things that we poo-pooed as we talked about the humanity. But moreover, it, it that level of emotional intelligence, that level of emotional connection and nurturing and all those things that we see, quote, as feminine. They're not feminine. They're existing men, too. But the societally conditioned that way is going to mean that we need women. We need women leaders more than we've ever needed them. I'm a big fan of that. And you find me on Twitter. One of my hashtags is... He, H E, the number four, she, he for she, hashtag he, he for she, because we need women leaders because they yes. need, we need to learn from them about yes. the humility you're talking about. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm so glad you've been here, Ed. Thank you so much for this. I want to encourage our viewers and our listeners to go and get Ed's book. Humility is the new smart. Couldn't agree more. Humility is the new smart. Rethinking human excellence in the smart machine age. Please go and get it. Ed, would you please tell our viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you, your book, and how to get a hold of you, uh, potentially to bring you in to speak or whatever it might be. My Everything about me is on the Darden Business School website under faculty under my name. You also can Google me and you'll see my faculty webpage. It's got my email. Uh, Dove, let me say to the thank you for having me. And I know this is sort of unusual for one of these, but I'm giving you right now a big hug, man, because <laughs> we... we, we and I'm serious, and it's 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 heartfelt because 
you're 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 doing great stuff and and uh, i applaud you what you're doing thanks for having me and and help in helping me be part of this and and onward man onward thank you so well it's been a, a like i said it's been a true honor a true pleasure to have you here and a I really do want to encourage everybody to go out there and get the book, Humility is the New Smart. It's going to really help you, really help you to grasp that this is, the human side is not an option. It's a necessity. You've yes. got to go out there and get it. Get a hold of Ed. Go to the website. Check it out. We will, of course, post that URL there. And remember, the research consistently shows that the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive. These fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they're spending a fortune on training and developing talent, but they're also leaving them at an alarming rate. And if you're sick of investing in training and development in your talent and only to have them turn around and leave you before you've got a return on your investment, then reach out to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle the and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by bringing you back to purpose bringing you back to purpose, fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. This is Dov Barron, Full Monty Leadership. I want to remind you to get over to matrix.fullmontyleadership.com, matrix like the movie, dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment. Ed was saying you've got to assess yourself and find out where you're actually at. This is a tool that will allow you to do that. It's valued at $197. It's absolutely free for you. So get yourself over there. Let's put our hands together and again, thank our guest today, Professor Edward Hess. <sighs> fabulous job. Thank you, sir. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to have you here. And I want to thank each of you for tuning in today. And stay curious, my friend. Stay curious. Uh, you can bring a little more humility, a little more humanity to your leadership. So next time, this is Doug Barron, and I am out.